So carrying on with our micro foundations video series, in the first video we were taking a look at our basic concept, scarcity choice, opportunity cost, how that there leads to marginal decision making, we talked about sunk costs, we looked at how this all fits into our production possibilities frontier, our budget constraint, and we wrapped up by talking about allocative and productive efficiency. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to move forward from this. We're going to take the ideas of our production possibilities frontier, our PPF. We're going to bring that together with allocative and productive efficiency to bring us kind of a simplified overview of what our market is, our supply curves, our demand curves, and really one of the fundamental workhorses of microeconomics. So without any further ado, let's jump over and take a look. So we wrapped up here taking a look at allocative, productive efficiency, and we have our production possibilities frontier on our right here. We took a look as we went through increasing our truck production. We witnessed that as we produced more and more and more trucks, the opportunity cost for trucks also increased, right? So we would have a higher and higher extra cost to produce an extra truck because every extra truck required more and more cars be given up. We also talked about, right, the kind of link that we could then make between this idea of marginal cost, the extra cost for an extra truck, with this increasing opportunity cost, the extra amount of cars given up for every extra truck we produce, very synonymous. We also took a look at this idea of marginal benefit, that is the extra benefit we receive for consuming or buying, utilizing an extra truck. And we talked about that, hey, first truck we buy, great, lots of extra benefit for us there. But as we as a society begin to have more and more and more on the road, well, there's not necessarily as much extra benefit being received, right? It's not like all of a sudden everybody needs to go haul a trailer or fill it with gravel or tools, etc., etc., all on the back of your truck. So as we have more and more and more of the same thing, the extra benefit we receive is diminishing. So increasing marginal cost, decreasing marginal benefit. Let's, let's take these together and take a look at what that, uh, what that gives us. Well, we'll get there. What we have and ultimately what we'll work into our marginal benefit, marginal cost, is our idea of the market. And if we want to take a look at this, what do we mean by market? This isn't necessarily our grocery market or the stock market or anything like that. While those are markets, ultimately a market is just any place where buyers, sellers come together to transact. And as they come together to transact, they will ultimately end up negotiating on a price and on a quantity in which will be bought and sold within this market on hold. What we witness is that typically, from the purchaser side, the amount of the good, and maybe we're still talking about trucks here, the amount of the good that they want to buy when the price is high would be really low. Meanwhile, as the price drops, we would be willing to buy more of the good. So that is, from the purchaser side, the amount that we demand is a downward sloping line. Demand. Such that I can say when the price is really high, my quantity demanded, quantity demanded would be very low. Alternatively, when the price is really low, my quantity demanded. Oh, let's use the right tool for that. My quantity demanded would be quite high. So inverse relationship there. Price low, price high. Higher the price, lower the quantity demanded. Lower the price, the higher the quantity demanded. This whole idea here is known as the law of demand. 
That's really chicken scratchy. Maybe let's try that again. Law of demand. Such that the law of demand states that price and quantity demanded are inversely related. That is, if the price rises, the quantity demanded falls. And vice versa also being true. If price were to fall, quantity demand would be rising. Okay, so that's from the purchaser's point of view, the purchaser's side. We would have on the flip side of this, our supply, the amount of goods that would be willing to be supplied by the producer. And typically speaking, we have kind of the opposite of our demand. At a low price, well, we're not really going to be willing to produce very much. So low price, low quantity supplied. However, if I can sell the good for a high price, well, now I'm going to be incentivized to produce lots and sell lots. So in this case here, my supply is upward sloping as such. Such that if we again do the same kind of idea at a low price, so right in this case here for my supply, price low, I would very similarly have a quantity supplied low. Alternatively, if I were to have a price high, if I were to have a price high, well, all the way out there, I would have a quantity supplied high. So very similar, instead of law of demand, we would have our law of supply. And the law of supply being that price and our quantity supplied are both positively related, meaning they go in the same direction. As price goes up, well, I'm going to be incentivized to produce more stuff. If the price falls, well, I'm not going to want to produce as much as I once was. Okay. What we can also think of these curves as is instead of supply and demand, we actually have quite a few synonyms available to us. This supply curve could also be seen as my minimum willingness to accept. That is, you'll notice what we did when we were talking about it for supply. We said, hey, at a price high, I would have this quantity supplied. So price to quantity was supply. On the alternative side, I could say, if I were to produce this quantity, what is the minimum price that I would accept in order to sell and produce this amount? Well, this quantity would correspond with this minimum price for me to accept. Very similarly, this low quantity up to my supply curve across would be this minimum price for me to accept. So I can also think of this supply curve as a minimum willingness to accept. Finally, what I can also view this as, hey, it's increasing. That is, I need to be accepting a higher and higher and higher price in order to produce more and more stuff. The reason why I need to accept a higher price to produce more things is, well, okay, I can get more money, but also the more of one thing I produce, the more of a cost I have for that one thing, right? We saw that with our opportunity costs as I produce more and more and more trucks. Well, higher and higher opportunity cost in terms of the amount of cars I have to give up. That is, we can also think of this supply curve as our marginal cost the extra cost to produce an extra unit. And in this case here, hey, as I produce QS high up to a price, this price would be that corresponding marginal cost, that corresponding extra cost to me to produce that last truck. So three different definitions, three different ways that we could think about our supply curve. Very similarly, we can do the same thing to our demand curve. Let's jump over and take a look at that. So we have our demand, which is again, what we did is we said, hey, I have a high price at this high price going down. This would be my quantity demanded. 
So price to quantity was the idea behind my demand curve. Well, very similarly, I could look at it the other way and I could say, if I only wanted to buy quantity demanded low, well, the highest, the absolute highest price that I'd be willing to pay for that would be price high. So in this sense here, my demand, if we look at it the other way, quantity to price also will represent my maximum willingness to pay. The highest possible price that I would be willing to pay for any quantity demanded. Very similarly as well, what we see with this with our trucks is that, hey, I'm willing to pay a high price for our first truck because I'd be getting a lot of benefit from that first truck. However, if I bought more and more and more and more trucks, on and on and on and on, well, the more trucks I buy, the less extra benefit I get from an extra truck. So if I were to buy a dozen trucks, well, I would want a much lower price per truck because I'm getting a lot less extra benefit from them. So in this sense here, I can also think of this demand curve as my marginal benefit such that at quantity demanded high, I could work out, okay, quantity demanded high up to my demand curve across this price low would similarly be the marginal benefit that is the extra benefit I received from that extra truck that I just purchased. So hey, that last truck that I purchased, ah, a very small extra benefit. In this case here, there's lots of trucks being produced. So our idea of a market on whole, our idea of the supply and the demand curves, and one way that we can think of them in kind of terms of this marginal cost and this marginal benefit. What we also get from this is our concept of equilibrium. And what we mean by equilibrium really is a balance point. A point where both the buyer and the seller are happy, where they are balanced, where there are no market forces kind of directing us one way or the other. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that idea of equilibrium. So we had our supply curve upward sloping. We have our demand curve downward sloping. Let's take a look at what happens if we have a high price. So let's drag this across and we'll call that price H. Maybe I can do a better H than that. Price H for price high. Well, what's happening at price high? Well, at price high, I'm going to have this quantity demanded. And at price high, my producer goes, that is an awesome price. We will produce lots and we will have this quantity supplied. What we'll notice is that there's a difference between the amount of stuff that the producer is producing and the amount of stuff you and I are buying. That is, in this scenario here, we have all of this as excess supply. Between the two, whenever we have a differentiation between our quantity demanded and our quantity supplied, we can always say that our quantity exchanged is the minimum of either our quantity supplied or our quantity demanded. So in this case here, the quantity demanded is the lesser of the two. So that would be my quantity exchanged. All right, and again, the way to think about this, cool, they're producing a million t-shirts at the current price. Everybody only wants to buy maybe a thousand t-shirts. So we have all of these extra t-shirts that are unable to be sold. They're just extra, excess supply, extra t-shirts sitting there in boxes. Okay. Well, that being said, what ends up happening? Well, the producer of t-shirts, they're not making t-shirts because they love t-shirts. I mean, maybe they do love t-shirts, but that's not their reason for producing them. They are producing t-shirts because they want to sell t-shirts because they want money. 
right? They want to maximize their profit from selling t-shirts. And by having these t-shirts just sitting in a box in a warehouse, that is not doing so. So in this case here where we have a high price, what the seller needs to do, the seller needs to start putting their t-shirts on clearance, needs to start liquidating these t-shirts, needs to start to drop the price. As the price of t-shirts begins to fall, what happens? Price falls, right? We'll move our way down. As the price falls, our quantity demanded rises. We say, hey, yeah, at a lower price, I'll buy some more t-shirts. But our producer goes, oh my, at this new lower price, I am not going to be producing as many t-shirts as I once was. So my quantity supplied falls. You'll notice that we still have a disequilibrium. We still have a distinction. We still have a difference between our quantity demanded and our quantity supplied. It's not as great, but we still have this excess supply. So what happens? Well, we go through another round of cuts. We go through another round of price drops, another round of liquidation. And as we go through this other round of liquidation, in this case, oh, maybe I overshot it a little bit there. Let's bring this back up. I end up at a point at some price such that at this point here, I have, I'll drag that all the way down, right there. I have my quantity demanded equal to my quantity supplied. That is, there's no longer any excess supply. There's no longer any reason for the producer to push down the price. We have a stable outcome. We have found balance. We have equilibrium. So that's the idea as to how prices would adjust downwards. Let's take a look at the flip side, though. What happens if we have a low price, and how does that price adjust up to equilibrium? So back to our supply and demand model, what happens if we have a low price? Well, let's put in a extremely low price here. All the way down there, we'll call this guy price low. At this low price, what's going on? Well, price to supply, that will give me my quantity supplied. Price over to my demand will give me my quantity demanded. And in this case, what we would notice is that we have excess demand. Right, again, the lesser of the two begin, becomes our quantity exchanged. So our quantity supplied becomes that quantity exchanged. That is, yeah, it's awesome that we want to buy this many concert tickets but only this many concert tickets were released. So given this situation here, we have a whole bunch of people who want to buy concert tickets, only so many concert tickets made available. What begins to happen? Well, what begins to happen is that the demander who really, really wants to see this concert, they begin to push up the price. As they begin to push up the price, saying, hey, hey, you have tickets? Yeah, I'll buy some from you. As that price begins to be pushed up, well, some of the people who were initially willing to buy concert tickets at the original price, they now back out. They go, yeah, no, no, at this new higher price, it's not worth it. I'll sell my ticket. No, thank you. I don't want one. Similarly, if the price begins to rise, producers realize this and producers start to say, wow, people are actually willing to pay more than we thought for this. Wow, if they're willing to pay this higher price, well, let's just release more tickets at this higher price. So, if possible, they will increase their quantity supplied. And we see that we have a narrowing of our excess demand. But still there, right? We still have this excess demand. So, this whole process continues yet again. The demanders, all this excess demand pushes up the price one more time. Right, Mind you, I'm making both of these examples happen in kind of iterations of three. That's no real reason other than just simplicity. This can take a long time to happen or it can happen rapidly depending on the market that ends up being discussed. 
What we would ultimately obtain though is a price such that at this price, supply equals demand. And so if supply equals demand, well then, our quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. That is, everybody who wants to buy a concert ticket at this price is able to buy a concert ticket at this price. And there's no reason to bid up the price. There's no reason for the producer to discount the price. It is stable and it will stay in this way unless some outside shock influences it. So that is, what we have is we have our equilibrium, supply and demand. Equilibrium, so let's just take a look at it without of all of our extra little bits here. Price, quantity. We'll have our demand curve, downward sloping here. We'll have our supply curve, upward sloping. Supply, demand, equilibrium will occur where the two are equal to each other. And what we will get is our equilibrium price and our equilibrium quantity exchanged. Okay. In this sense here, what we can also kind of recall from our previous video and from the start of this video as well, is we can say, hey, supply, while demand... Demand was also our marginal benefit. If we recall, if we go back and look at that, we said, hey, allocative efficiency, allocative efficiency occurred when our marginal benefit equals marginal cost. That is, our allocative efficiency occurs right at equilibrium here. That is, if we are at equilibrium in this market, then we are allocating our resources effectively, we are allocating our resources efficiently. That is, the cost to society for producing this is equated with the extra benefit that society receives from consuming it, such that social surplus, the net benefit society receives from this good or service is maximized. We are utilizing our resources in the most efficient way we can, given the technology and resources we have. So, allocative efficiency in this sense here. How does this all fit together back to our production possibility frontier? Well, let's take a quick look at that. And there'll be a big diagram to kind of see how this all fits together. Four graphs all together. So, let's take a look. Let's start off up in the top right here. Up in the top right, we'll start off with our production possibilities frontier. Taking a look at trucks. Actually, I think I had that the other way in my original one. I think I had cars and trucks. We then had our production possibility frontier. Something like that. And... And what we can do next, any point on that frontier is efficient, inside is inefficient, outside unobtainable. We can then take a look at our market for trucks. So let's go quantity of trucks, price of trucks, and we'll then go and say we have a demand for trucks that looks something like that, downward sloping. Oh, wrong color. Demand for trucks. We'll then go upward sloping. We'll have something like this. That is our supply. And what we'll notice is there's our quantity exchanged. There's our price. Bringing that up. We get a point on our production possibility frontier as to where we are producing. Right Here's our quantity trucks exchanged in equilibrium corresponding to the amount we're producing. Hey, if we're producing, if we're making this many trucks, well then it must be that we are making this many cars. So we would have quantity cars. 
What we can then do is we can drag this over and we can take a look at that for the market for cars. And the way we can do that, we can do a little trick here. A little trick is we can make a bounce line. We can go cars equals cars. If cars equals cars, this is just a 45 degree line. And the only reason we'd want to do that is just to flip our axes. So that is to go hit that and to bounce it down as such. And then we can go and we can take a look at our market for cars. So again, price, quantity cars. We can drag this yellow line all the way down. And what we would find over in this market is our demand for cars. And then similarly, our supply for cars, yielding, of course, our equilibrium. Oh, let's change colors for that, keep things consistent. Quantity of cars, and again, our corresponding price, such that we would have an allocatively efficient market in both cases. Marginal benefit equals marginal cost, and very similarly, producing right off of our production possibilities frontier. So the way that individual markets can fit together. Keeping in mind so far, this is micro. We're looking at specifically one market, market for trucks, and how that works and how things change, influencing net surplus, net benefits to society, prices, quantities produced, etc., etc. The decisions made by individual economic agents. And we see how a, a decision influencing the market for trucks will ultimately feed through to affect the market for cars as well. Okay, well, let's take a look at one last thing with our supply and our demand diagram, and that is shocks to equilibrium. This is known as comparative statics. That is, hey, we're in equilibrium. We have this equilibrium price and quantity. We'll stay there forever until something pushes us out. And so let's talk about what those things are that may push us out of equilibrium. So if we want to think about this, let's take a look. Let's draw one more time. We'll be drawing lots of graphs as we move through this course. I'd highly recommend as you watch these videos that you have a piece of paper beside you, that you're taking notes on that piece of paper, and that you are drawing along as we go. Because there's lots of little graphs that come up. And being able to draw, being able to interpret these graphs as we go through the semester is crucially important to you. Okay, so starting off, uh, let's just leave off. Yeah, let's, let's, sure. We'll have our equilibrium price and we'll have our equilibrium quantity. Price and quantity. What we want to do is we want to list the different factors that are going to influence the supply curve list the different factors that are going to influence this demand curve and then recognize that okay if any of these factors change we're going to have a new demand curve or we're going to have a new supply curve that is technically when we draw this we are drawing all of this underneath the assumption well underneath the statement that we are drawing these cetris paribus and what that means is that we are drawing this graph holding everything else in the world constant. All we are representing is how a change in price results in a change in our quantity supplied or a change in our quantity demanded, depending on which curve we're referring to. That is, income is constant, preferences are constant, technology is constant, weather is constant. Everything that we could imagine in the world that might influence the supply and demand for this is constant. The only thing we're allowing to change in this model is the price of the good we're talking about. But clearly that's limited. Clearly there's other things that do change. So let's take a look at those other things that do change and we'll start off with the supply curve. So what may change in the supply curve is price of inputs. 
So that is price of the raw resources, the raw materials that we need in order to produce this good. So that is, again, if we're still talking about this market for trucks, maybe it's the case where all of a sudden we have an increased cost in labor. Our workers have all of a sudden asked for an increase in their wages. They have gone on strike and we need to start paying them more. Well, that's an increased cost of production. Increased cost of production means that it's going to be difficult to continue to produce the same amount of stuff I used to be able to at the same price. So as my cost of inputs changes, so is going to be my ability to produce. Another thing that may end up influencing this is the price of another good. Right, and in this case here, we can have what we would call either a complement or a substitute of production. And these are things, complements are things that just kind of fall off as we produce the thing we're interested in. That is, as we produce lumber, we get sawdust. If we want to produce more lumber, well, we just by default get more sawdust as well. Substitutes, well, substitutes are going back to our production possibility frontier. These are things that, hey, if we produce more trucks, that means we produce fewer cars. And what we can see, the market for cars and trucks are intricately linked, cars and trucks. If I were to ramp up truck production, well, that would mean fewer cars. More trucks, fewer cars, meaning I would have an adjustment in equilibrium in both markets. So we would have to evaluate that. In this case, I'm talking about the market for trucks. So if I had a change in my market for cars, that would be a substitute that would change. That would have some material impact on this market as well. What else do I have? We have price of inputs. We have price of other goods. We are gonna have as well what we would refer to as weather or technology. Weather technology, what we mean by this is this is just going to be exogenous events that end up influencing our ability to produce. Typically, but not always, typically weather is seen as a negative effect. Maybe we have a forest fire or a hurricane that shuts down our ability to produce. Well, if it shuts down our ability to produce, we can't produce as much at the fixed price point. So quantity supplied falls. Technology is typically, but again, not always, seen as a positive. That is, we have some new technological advancement that allows us to, tetris paribus, all else constant, increase the amount of stuff we're producing. So supply shifting to the right, quantity supplied increasing. What we would also have, we would also have underneath supply here, we would have the number of suppliers. How many producers are out there all producing the same thing? Are there lots of them? The more that are producing it, the more that are supplying it, well, the more supply there is, the supply goes farther to the right. The fewer producers, the fewer that are supplying it, well, then the less supply we have, the less quantity supplied we have, and our supply would shift to the left. So here we have a cursory quick overview of some of our big factors that influence our supply curve or our determinants of supply. A final one, a final determinant that we can consider is regulations. And that is government regulations, how willing it is, how easy it is to go through all that red tape to be able to produce. The more costly it is to produce, the more strict, the more severe the regulations, well, the more difficult it is to produce, the less quantity supplied at a given price point. The more lax the regulations, well, the more lax the regulations, the cheaper it is to produce, the more you can produce at a given price point. So our final kind of determinant or factor of supply would be the regulations that the government places on our supply, on our ability to produce. What about our demand? Very similarly then, 
our demand will have its factors. It will have its determinants that determine where it's located in this grid system. One of the first things that we can take a look at, kind of going along the same lines there, is we can start by taking a look at price of other goods. Right, and again, what we can have is we can have complements and we can have substitutes, and in this case here, complements and substitutes of consumption. Complements, things that are bought together, such as peanut butter and jam, hot dogs and hot dog buns, right? Typically in this case here, if the price of hot dogs goes up, well, we buy fewer hot dogs, but we would also buy fewer hot dog buns. If we're talking about trucks, if the price of gas goes up, well, gas and trucks are bought together, right? If you have a truck, you buy lots of gas. If the price of gas goes up, well, people are going to want fewer and fewer trucks because it becomes more and more costly to maintain them, to run them. So as the price of gasoline goes up, the demand for trucks decreases. Substitutes of consumption are things we buy instead of. So a substitute of consumption would be a car versus a truck. Typically, you buy one or the other. You don't buy them both in conjunction. Other substitutes would be you either typically go for a hot dog or a hamburger. You go for a coffee or a tea, right? Very rarely are you like, no, 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 I go for both a coffee and a tea at the same time. I can't have my coffee without my tea. Uh, typically, they're substitutes, right? Typically, they're substitutes. So first kind of determinant influencing our demand curve. What do we have next? Next, we have income. The more income we have, well, the more money we have, the more stuff we're able to consume, the more stuff we're able to buy. As I want to buy more stuff, as I have more money, I have more demand for a good or service. So as my income goes up, my demand typically also goes up. I also have, I'll lump these together. Tastes, preferences, and expectations. That is, are trucks popular? Do trucks have an image that go with them that just then promotes the then demand for more trucks? Or do trucks have an image that go with them of just being excess, of just being waste and all of that? In which case, depending on what kind of popular opinion is of this, as people kind of go with that popular opinion, it will influence it, their taste or their preference towards this good or service. Tastes and preferences change throughout time, right? Sometimes we have a taste for trucks. We're like, yeah, you know what? Trucks are great. We need them. Everybody wants to have a truck. And other times it's, why? Why would I need a truck? I'm not towing a trailer. I don't have a ton of tools I need to put in the back. Why do I need that? Why do I need this massive thing to drive around through a city. So taste change, often depending on where you are, depending on what's going on, tastes and preferences right there, they're going to influence the demand for a good or service. What else are we going to have? Well, we have price of other goods, we have income, we have taste, preferences, and expectations. We're also going to have seasonal effects. So this one here is going to be tough to kind of make the link to our truck market. But for example, if we were talking about candy, there is a seasonal change in the demand for candy. Kind of as we move into October, November, December, there is a spike in the demand for candy. People want a bunch of candy for Halloween. Then we move into our holiday, our Christmas kind of candies, right? So we have, boom, a spike in our demand for candy in that kind of time there. And then usually come January, we're all sick of it. We make these resolutions to be healthy and seasonal demand for candy drops off. This is a very common trend we see year after year after year. We see a spike in demand and then it falls off. Spike in demand and then it falls off. Same thing can be said as we come and as we approach summertime, we see a spike in demand for ice cream and in cold beverages. In the winter, not, not so much, right? In the winter, well, it's cold. We don't really want cold beverages. So what happens then? 
in the winter, we have a seasonal spike in demand for our warm drinks, our warm beverages. And so we have a seasonal change depending on what's happening there. And you might be saying like, hey, Keith, seasonality, taste preferences, those seem to be really linked. Yeah, they definitely are. And really to say one over the other isn't going to be right or wrong. They're both going to have the same effects in the end. The distinction between the two is tastes are kind of more long-term. Tastes, preferences typically last for a bit longer. Not always. Seasonal, I guess, would be more they repeat. Every year we witness the same thing. Around Christmas time, we see a spike in demand for consumer junk for gifts, right? Just trinkets and all of that kind of stuff. We see this spike seasonally for candy. All of these things are regular things year after year after year. Thus, our seasonal demand. Final thing to influence our demand curve would be our population. The more people we have in an area, the more people demanding a good or service, the more quantity that is being demanded. So, hey, if we had a whole bunch of people in Victoria, yes, we would have a lot more demand for trucks. If we have fewer people living somewhere else, we would have less demand for trucks because there's less people. So, demand, just like how supply is dependent on the number of suppliers, well, demand is also dependent on the population. Okay, let's take a look at some examples of this. Let's take a look at how exactly these fit together and really what we can go, what we can work through and maybe a few examples of comparative statics. Like, hey, we have a shock in this. What ends up happening to us as we work through? So let's go take a look. Let's start off with our supply and demand, our basic market. This is always a good place to start. Draw this out. Don't try to do this in your mind. You'll mess yourself up, I promise. So we have our price. We have our quantity. We have downward sloping our demand curve and upward sloping. We have our supply curve. We have at initial equilibrium. We have our equilibrium price. Let's actually line that up there. And we would have our equilibrium quantity exchanged. So there's my quantity exchanged. There's my equilibrium price. Okay, well, let's suppose that this here is the market for rentals, right? So for real estate rentals. And so we have our price, our going price for a real estate rental for say, maybe we're looking at one bedroom units and we have the total quantity of one bedroom units currently exchanged on the market. Let's suppose that all of a sudden we have a surge in our population. That is all of a sudden a ton of people are like, wow, Victoria, the South Island is a beautiful place. We want to go live there. So lots of people all of a sudden move to Victoria, Greater Victoria, South Island. What ends up happening? Well, this surge in population, well, as we said, if we take a look at our determinants of supply and demand, that is right in our situation there. This is affecting our population. So what begins to happen? Well, this surge in population is going to cause a surge in demand. That surge in demand means that my demand is going to be going out to the right. And this is truthfully how you want to think about this. You want to think about this as this demand curve moving, as that old demand curve ceasing to exist altogether. We have had a surge in people being here. They all are looking for rentals because they're all looking for rentals. What has happened? Cetris Paribus, so for a fixed price, I now have my new quantity demanded. I have all this new quantity demanded for rentals, but keep in mind, what used to be my quantity exchanged is now just price to supply, just my quantity supply. Meaning, what do I have right now? 
Right now, I have excess demand. Excess demand, what happens with this? What's our story? Well, given all this excess demand, the people moving here, they go, wow, I wanted to move here. It's a beautiful place, but I'm having a really hard time finding somewhere to live. Oh, there's a rental available. I'll go try to get it. Oh, it's gone. Huh. How do I make sure I get one? Well, what I can do to ensure I get a rental when I show up is I can start to bid up the price. I can begin to say, hey, hey, I'll give you extra money if I get this rental over the next person. As we do this, as we bid up the price, well, certain people who had moved here or who had lived here for a while now go, wow, with this new rising rent, it's pretty costly to be here. I don't know if I want to keep renting. So as some people bid up this price of rentals, the quantity demanded begins to fall. Some people begin to drop out of the rental market. They decide, yeah, I don't like this anymore. I'm moving somewhere else, moving somewhere cheaper. What also begins to happen is on the flip side, we have landlords, we have people who have suites that are available to rent. They now look at it and they're going, wow, we can rent out our room for that much? Well, if we can rent out our room for that much, we're going to start to increase the amount of units we have available and we move up along the supply curve in that sense. This whole process continues, continues, continues until we arrive at a new equilibrium and we have a new market price and we have a new quantity exchanged such that in relation to the initial, we have a rise in price and we have a rise in quantity exchanged all together. So an increase in both in that scenario there. Okay. Surge in population causing an increase in price, causing an increase in quantity exchanged. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Okay, so in this case, let's think about the market for air travel. In the market for air travel, from August 2014, August 2014 to January 15th, price of jet fuel, price of jet fuel increased by 47%. That's a massive increase in the cost of jet fuel. What we want to do is we want to work out what is the impact of this on our market for air travel. So let's, let's work through this. And I'd highly recommend, pause the video, see if you can work through this on your own. See if you can think about what's happening and see if you get the same result. So go ahead and pause it. If not, well, we're going to have our demand. We are going to have upward sloping. We're going to have our supply. And these guys together are going to yield for us an equilibrium market price and an equilibrium quantity exchange. Okay. In this case here, we're talking about the market for air travel. So, right, this would be the price of a ticket to board the plane and quantity, this would be the quantity of tickets sold. How many people are actually flying all together? Okay, price of jet fuel goes up. So okay, we gotta think about what this means, what this influences. Think about it from your perspective. You are a demander of flights. Does the price of jet fuel affect your demand directly? That is, if we think about it, does, do you buy jet fuel directly? Are you like, well, I was going to buy jet fuel, but instead I just bought a plane ticket. No, 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 right? You don't buy jet fuel directly. So it's not influencing your price of other goods. It's not influencing your income, taste, preferences, expectations. It's not a seasonal thing. It's not a population thing. So it's not affecting our demand. Okay, so maybe supply that. Is it a regulation? No, eh, not really. No. Whether, no. Price of other goods, well, okay, this is again, price of other goods of production. Our airline producers, WestJet, Air Canada, they're not like, well, I'm either going to sell a ticket or I'm going to produce and sell jet fuel. 
No, no, no. They're not, they're not in the business of making jet fuel. They're in the business of using jet fuel. That is, this guy here is a change in our price of inputs. So let's take a look at what happens there. Price of jet fuel went up by 47%. This is a change, little triangle, Greek symbol for delta, meaning a change in. So a change in the price of inputs, more expensive, meaning all else equal Cetris Paribus, I am not able to produce as much as I once was. Let's use a straight line for that. Right, that is, if you want to think about it, my quantity supplied falls because for a fixed price, I'm not able to produce as much as I once was. If my quantity supplied falls, what's going on there? That means that my supply curve was shifting to the left. Supply curve shifting to the left. Let's just get rid of this tail that's sticking out there. There we go. Supply curve shifting to the left, giving you my new quantity supplied. We'll notice what used to be our quantity exchanged is now just our quantity demanded. And we're in disequilibrium. Once again, we have a case of excess demand. Where do we go from here? Well, from here, this excess demand, people really want tickets, but the airlines are not willing to offer as many flights at the given price. So people who really need to fly start to bid up the price of tickets. As they begin to signal that they're willing to pay more, the airline responds by increasing the price. And by increasing the price, they open up the amount of tickets they're selling. This whole process continues, moving up and along our demand curve. That is, as price goes up, some of the people who were willing to fly are now not willing to fly at the higher price moving up and along our supply curve until we arrive at our new higher market price and new lower quantity exchanged. So in this scenario here, we'd have a negative supply shock, price went up, quantity supply went down. Okay, you can also think about in kind of another way here as to what happened to the market for air travel, once we got hit with uh, COVID and everything got shut down there, can work through that. That's potentially a 2-1 effect, right? Potentially it impacted demand, potentially it impacted supply. You can think about that one on your own, see if you can work through that. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions for it. If you want more examples about these comparative statics, go check the textbook. End of chapter three, there is self-check questions. If you click on the little number that is hyperlinked beside this one that we just worked through was question five from the textbook, it will give you a step-by-step -step work through as to what to expect and what the final answer is. So feel free to take a look at that. Some extra questions there on comparative statics. That does us though for our introduction to the market, to supply and demand curves. Our next video, our next lesson on this micro foundations is going to be on the supply and demand for labor markets, financial markets, and the idea of a circular flow diagram. The way that money, the way that resources flow around the economy. This next video that you'll be coming to is the final video for our foundations, for our micro foundations If you have any questions though about what we've gone through, of course, feel free to reach out to me either by email or post to the D2L Frequently Asked Questions. Thanks, until next time.